Welcome, this is a quick tutorial on feedforward networks, the most simple of neural network architectures. You can think of them as transformations that take in a set of features and output a transmuted version of those features um, that may be a slightly different dimensional size. So they can be used for dimension transformation. They can also be used to learn different aspects of a problem through traditional neural network training um, and to uh, learn that in a way that can be used to solve particular tasks in neural networks. So a particular feed forward layer might, for instance, learn to pick up certain patterns in the data. Um, and as it sees more of these patterns and is trained through sort of a, a back propagation process, um, the weights will get updated so it's better at picking up on that pattern. Um, there are handy components for solving very simple problems that don't depend on any sort of sequential aspect in your data. Um, and they're often used in more complicated neural networks. So when we talk about sequential data, uh, we're talking about like images, uh, sound files, um, long sentences, things where one part of the, um, the input may need that, that context is really important in solving it. So for feed forward networks, they're very bad at like keeping that context together. Uh, something at the start of a sentence isn't going to really have any different meaning to it than something at the end of a sentence. Um, but in situations where order doesn't matter, they can still be really powerful tools for solving problems. In training neural network architectures, it's really important to think about the dimensions of your data and the dimensions of your model. Um, you can think of our dimensions of the data in terms of like a block. So technically they're, they're called tensors, they're matrices of matrices. Um, and so they're a way to store um, information that may correspond with different aspects of your problem. In our case, we have a three by four by three tensor. Um, and each of these three dimensions has a different property associated with it. The first is uh, this n dimension, our batch size. And that just says, how many examples are in this training input. Each of these could correspond to a different sentence in our training set, um, and we've simply packaged them together to take advantage of um, the parallelization of um, this training process. So they're technically independent sort of samples, um, but it's important to know that you can train with chunks of different samples at the same time. Our second dimension is this H dimension, our embedding dimension or hidden dimension, whatever you want to call it. It corresponds to the amount of uh, a, a representation of the data for that particular, for one particular item in our batch. So this vertical block here corresponds to all of the data we would have for one part of one of our examples in the batch. The last dimension I'm simply leaving as an example of any other dimension you might have in your problem. The reason why I include it is because feed forward networks usually only apply to one dimension at a time. Um, and I just want to clearly illustrate that you could have other in, other dimensions in your model, but they wouldn't necessarily need to apply to that at the same time. Or, or rather, the same transformation would be happening across all of the, um, all of this O dimension, but it would be an independent transformation each time. So you can think of one step in this training process as this blue set of blocks. So your four by three 
block on the very outside of this input would get transformed by our feed forward network to create this two by three block in our output. How do we get two by three? Simply because our feed forward network takes a number of inputs and gives a number of outputs. Um, in our case, the inputs is going to correspond with the dimension that we're transforming over, our H dimension. So it has to be four in order for these to match up. We can set our output dimension to whatever we want. Um, the only difference is that we would need to add more of these uh, horizontal blocks um, and we would be in essence making a larger neural network if we wanted to do that. In our case, since we only have two of these, um, these blocks um, or these sets of blocks, um, they are only going to create um, one part of the output each. So you get one from the first vertical column and one from the second vertical column. This process then repeats itself across all of the other dimensions in our input. So for O0, we would create this first one. O1, we'd create this second one. And so O2, we'd create this last one. And that's sort of looking at how our feed forward network would change the shape of our data as it's passed through. Next, let's look a little bit more closely at the components that make up this network. So first we have a linear layer. Um, and linear layer is oftentimes shorthand for the whole feed forward network itself. Um, but we can also look at the individual component, um, this nn dot, dot linear um, from the PyTorch library. Um, and what it does is it will take in some input, again, corresponding to some input dimensions, and it'll output something based on the output dimensions that we've set up. So in our case, if we say we want to take a dimension four input and give a dimension two input, um, then we'll be able to um, pass it in and then see the, the size and shape of our outputs. In our case, we'll use the following convention for referring to the dimensions on our model. Our first dimension is go going to correspond to our batch size, and our second dimension is going to correspond to this hidden or embedding dimension, um, the sort of guts of the data of a particular sample. In this case, what we'll do is we'll generate some random data. This is just generating um, some random numbers in a two by four tensor. Um, we're going to then pass this through our linear layer and we'll print out the before and after appearance of the, um, of the dimensions of it as well as the values in the network. Finally, we can look at the actual components of the linear layer. Uh, which are the weight and the bias of the network. So we look at this a little bit more in detail. Our initial input was a two by four tensor, had some values. These are all floating point numbers. Um, and then it's going to get transmuted by this linear layer into a two by two um, tensor. So. How do we get the second dimension here? Um, that's just because our output dimension is, is two. Why is the first dimension also two? That just corresponds to our batch size, which was not impacted by um, the linear transformation in any way. So all of the data across the first row corresponds to data in our first example. And this simply gets compressed down into two values in the output tensor. But these are always the first ex example, um, and then in our second row, the values from the second example. They never sort of cross paths in any way. 
if we look at the actual feed forward network weights, we see that it's just a two by four matrix um, with the four representing the input dimension and the two being our output dimension. For each of the output dimensions, you also have this bias value, and this simply gets added to the um, to the transformation um, and could be a way to adjust um, the, the performance of the linear layer. So both the weights and the bias are updated during training um, and are an important part of uh, how neural networks learn. So how a training process would happen is you would take some tensor, pass it through the model. Um, PyTorch will keep track of um, the gradient, which is basically a way of saying uh, how much different components of that tensor are, have been impacted by a certain function or a certain um, uh, piece of the network. And then after all of these examples have been passed through, you'll do what's called backpropagation, which is um, you'll use the calculated gradients to then update the weights um, depending on uh, how much a particular weight may have impacted the ultimate output value. Um, so if your training is relying on some particular weight heavily for the training process. So this is the largest one in our series, and maybe that has the most influence in our, in our output. Um, then the corresponding gradient uh, may also be very high. And if that's the case, it will subsequently be updated based on the backwards backpropagation pass as your training. Um, and the next round of training we'll use these updated weights where it might be even larger or maybe smaller if, if it predicted, if it used that value to predict wrongly. The next component of a feedforward network is a nonlinear activation function. So if you only had um, a linear transformation, you'd only be able to solve what are called linearly separable problems. Um, and you can think of this as like, um, could you draw a line between the positive and negative classes in a, a graph of your problem? And it turns out there are many problems like that, um, but many interesting problems do not have that property. And so by adding a nonlinear activation function, you're able to um, make uh, this sort of nonlinear boundary between your positive and negative class and um, to make predictions uh, that can solve um, non-linearly separable problems. So that's an important aspect of neural network architectures is this ability to solve non-linearly separable problems. There are many nonlinear activation functions that you can use in training. Um, I've just grabbed a few samples of both, so two classic and sort of two more modern um, activation functions. And what I'm going to do is just plot what these functions look like. So our first function is called sigmoid, um, and it has this sort of um, sigmoid is sort of means like a S-shaped curve. So it has sort of an S-shaped curve um, the blue line in our in our diagram. Um, it was the earliest activation function used in training neural networks. It's largely been abandoned for um, for different other activation functions um, for various reasons. Um, but it's sort of a classic in uh, in neural network training. Um, a more modern and probably the most popular current activation function is called ReLU. 
Um, and relu is the simplest activation function. It's the identity function when your input into it is positive. Um, so it just returns whatever it gets. And then when it's negative, it just gives zero. Turns out this is very a, a very powerful um, nonlinear activation function. Um, it's su super simple to implement um, and very effective. Um, a very modern twist on this is called um, SILU, um, also known as the swish uh, activation function. Um, and it looks very similar to ReLU, um, except it has like a slight negative area um, in the low negative numbers. Um, and although it's off the range here, um, it will continue upward and go back to zero as it reaches negative infinity. Um, one aspect that's beneficial of this is because there is um, some negative value that's still allowed with the function, um, you'll be able to accommodate for um, situations where a, a unit in your network might be set to zero. Um, in ReLU, there's no difference if it's um, set to, if, if you have something that's negative, it's sort of just going to always be um, negative and it's not necessarily going to impact your model in any beneficial way. Um, and sometimes you need that. Um, but so in this case, will still be able to uh, learn in that case. So the negative from there can be used to update um, the those units in your network. Um, and that turns out to be quite effective. Um, the last activation function is the hyperbolic tan function, um, and hyperbolic tangent function. Um, and it's also an S shape. Um, different from sigmoid, where sig sigmoid is um, defined between 0 and 1, um, the hyperbolic tangent function is defined between negative uh, 1 and uh, 1. Um, or, or rather, the output ranges of it are between negative 1 and 1. Um, it was used for quite a while as like a update to sigmoid and is still used in many recurrent neural net architectures as like the core activation function. We can take a quick look at sort of what happens before and after um, some input is passed into a activation function. So for sigmoid, our first one, you have um, values are going to get put between 0 and 1, um, with very large negative values being close pushed closer to 0, um, and very large positive values pushed closer to 1. Um, for ReLU, all you're going to have is all your negative values set to 0. Um, for SILU, you'll end up having um, similar properties to ReLU, except um, your positive values aren't going to be quite as... Um, it's not quite the identity function like it is with ReLU, so they'll get dampened a little bit. Um, same with like small negative values, they'll, they'll get dampened slightly. Um, but if you have a really, really large negative value, that will get pushed towards zero. Finally, with our hyperbolic tangent function, um, you have sort of the same properties of sigmoid, um, except spread between negative one and one now. So, um, large positive values go towards one, large negative values go towards negative one. So in machine learning, there's a really important concept called regularization. Regularization is the sort of techniques used to prevent your model from overfitting to a training set. 
In other words, how do you get it to better generalize to unseen data? And one way you can do that with neural networks is through a technique called dropout. Dropout randomly zeroes out certain values uh, passed through a dropout layer. Um, and that allows your model to no longer rely on um, specific parts of the feature space for a classification decision. So if you're randomly turning off uh, certain parts of your uh, network as you're passing stuff through it, um, your network will try and spread the burden. So um, different cells will try and learn similar sorts of things, um, and you'll be less over-reliant on uh, a few certain cells in your network from over-specializing in a way that can be detrimental um, if you suddenly encounter an example that doesn't quite look exactly like what you've seen so far. So dropout is pretty simple. Um, a dropout layer is just defined by the probability chance of dropping something as you pass it through it. Um, and then what happens is you'll, you'll simply drop the values um, randomly as they go through. Let me run this again. The last thing to mention about dropout layers is that they will also um, they'll scale your um, outputs from the model. So um, each of these is scaled proportional to the pro to the amount of um, the probability for that layer. So in our case, we'll have sort of these four inputs that get dropped out. Um, and then everything else just gets um, increased slightly. And with a probability of 50% to drop, that actually is going to correspond with doubling all of the values get, that get passed through. So you can think of it as sort of like reallocating uh, some of that um, input space into other, um, other parts of the tensor. If we wanted to set up a simple neural network, we could do so now. Um, so we can make a um, uh, sort of the simplest um, feedforward network by just incorporating these three things together. So in PyTorch, you generally make models by creating a, a class for your model um, and then attach all of the layers um, to it in your initialization function. So those who are unfamiliar with object-oriented programming, what's going on here is that um, you're creating a object um, that is simply put a way to package data with means to access and modify that data. So in our case, the sort of data that we're attaching to this um, object are going to be these three uh, layers. So we'll attach this um, linear layer, uh, um, hyperbolic tangent activation function, and then a dropout layer. And then the way we can sort of do stuff with the data we've attached is through a, uh, a forward pass or a forward method for our function. And all this is going to do is take in some input data and pass it through the layers of our model as we've tied together here. So first, it'll pass through our uh, linear layer, which we've called layer. Um, then we'll pass that to the activation. And then we'll pass that through our dropout layer. So a one layer network not particularly exciting, but this will allow us to illustrate um, some other properties of, um, of a, a dropout layer. So again, we're going to create some random tensor. Um, instantiate our simple dropout model. As, um, and so all this is really doing is um, if our class is a template for the model, we're going to now actually build that into our 
um, into the memory of our computer. We're gonna we're gonna store that in some physical space in the in the computing infrastructure we have. Now we're going to pass our tensor through the model we just made, um, and then we're going to compare that to what happens if we take our model and turn on eval mode. Um, so if we scroll down to look at the outputs, in our first case, we pass some stuff through, and then the outputs, again, are randomly dropped out. Um, in our eval version, again, we pass the same thing through, but this time, um, nothing gets dropped out because in the eval mode, we're now uh, taking off this sort of, um, uh, this sort of, uh, drop out blinders and we're enabled to use the model for um, all its power. So that's just a quick template of how you can set up a, a very, very simple model in this way and how you can uh, sort of test things out about it. Last thing we need to do before we get training is uh, to introduce something called the softmax function. And so softmax is just a way for us to normalize the outputs of our model so it fits a probability distribution. And this is important for things like uh, cross-entropy loss um, because it'll then take that probability distribution and compare it with the, the, ex the gold standard probability distribution of what you'd want for an output from the model. Um, and comparing those two, it allows you to um, calculate how far off from um, being perfect um, and then use that loss in the back propagation process and um, update the weights in our model. When you're using softmax, it's important to specify the, the right dimension that you want to take uh, for softmax. And usually this is going to be the last dimension in our model. In Python, this is usually writing it as negative one. So it'll gra grab the last dimension possible in your thing. In our case, we have a two dimension problem. Um, our first dimension is going to represent the batch. Um, and the second one is going to be the embedding or the hidden size. Um, you never want to take your uh, softmax over the batch because that would be sort of normalizing over the different examples in your in your training block. Um, and those have nothing to do with one another. Ideally, each element in a batch is treated independently. So we should keep those um, as independent as possible. Um, so the right way to do it is to do it over this hidden dimension. Um, and again, if you just specify generally like dim equals negative one, you're going to grab that last dimension in your um, in your tensor, and then you'll normalize over that. Um, for examples here, this is our input tensor, where each row is going to co correspond to one single example in your batch. Um, and then what you'll do is you'll you'll normalize over that um, the hidden units in that one example. So if you were to add these up, which I'm too lazy to do. It should add up to one, and each of the individual values should correspond to um, sort of the, the probability weight of that part of the model. What you can think of is these might correspond to the probabilities of different classes that your um, model would be predicting. So um, this one might say that class three um, had a 36 probability chance of being right. And in our second example here, this is saying that class two might have like a nearly 50% chance of being right. All right, so let's put this to work in a simple sentiment analysis task. So sentiment analysis is this um, very common NLP natural language processing task to identify whether some statement is a good thing or a bad thing, or says a bad thing about something. So difference between, wow, that movie sucked, and um, something like, wow, that was the best sandwich of my life. The first one would be sort of a negative sentiment. The um, 
second one would be a positive sentiment. And this is very valuable for companies that might do things like monitor the effectiveness of ads on Twitter or uh, monitor their brand's um, name recognition on Twitter. Um, it's still very handy. Um, and it's a, it's a um, common example of a, of a classification task. And there are many, many other types of classification tasks you can have, but this is a very easy one to illustrate. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use um, this Stanford Cinnamon Tree Bank, which is a set of these uh, positive negative labeled sentences, um, very simple sentences, no more than usually like a few words in each of them. Um, and we're gonna train a model to recognize whether or not something's uh, a sentence is saying that something is good or bad. Um, because our feed forward networks are unable to deal with sequences of data, we're gonna employ something called an embedding bag. What the embedding bag does is it takes a, a, a chunk of tokens in a sentence and it, it gets like um, uh, the corresponding um, tensors that would correspond to each of the words in the sentence. Um, and then it compresses those all of those uh, tensor embeddings into just a single summarization. Uh, so it's a way of eliminating the sequence aspect of a sentence. You just sort of use the embedding bag to compress everything into one summarized uh, tensor input. So what we're going to do is first grab our data, and we're going to use the Torch Text Datasets library to do that. So we're going to import this Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. Um, we're going to grab a couple other help, helpful um, functions from the Tor Torch Text library. Um, so the first one's going to allow us to build a vocab object um, from the corpus itself. Um, and that'll allow us to map between the actual words in our sentence and sort of token IDs, which are sort of number equivalents of the words, uh, and vice versa. Uh, we'll have some sort of tokenizer that we'll use on it. Um, and we're going to use some other data set tools. For training neural networks, it's very common to use um, a, a CUDA capable um, graphics processing unit. So CUDA is um, a super efficient um, GPU computation library. Um, and all this code does is check see if our machine is CUDA capable, um, which is to say you have a NVIDIA card installed, um, you have the right drivers for it, you have CUDA installed, and your version of PyTorch has is compatible with all of that. Um, and so I'll check if that's true, um, and then try to, um, we'll, we'll set whichever one as our device. Second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the data sets themselves. Um, in machine learning, it's common to use three splits of a data set. Your train, uh, which we'll, you'll use for model training, um, a development, or also sometimes known as a validation set. Um, and all that is used for is to see whether or not um, the model that you've created is a good optimized version of that model. So are you on the right course for your model training and um, is it the, the most optimized of a model you can be? And then the last thing you would use is a test set. In our case, we're not gonna use a test set. And the reason why is generally you only use your test set if you are you are done with your sort of machine learning experiment um, and you want to evaluate it on a, um, a hidden set um, that you haven't looked at previously. Um, so that's really important because um, if you only use two sets, um, 
your training set, um, you'll, you'll learn and fit to the training set very, very quickly. But if you're also very commonly like um, evaluating on sort of the test set, you might end up wandering into a particular configuration that just happens to be really, really good for that set, um, but isn't actually generalizable to unseen data. Um, that's bad. Um, in machine learning, we call this sort of the golden rule of machine learning. The idea that your test set is always sort of hidden away until you're completely done with the experiment um, and then you crack it out um, at the very end to determine how well you do. So we use this dev set as a proxy for your, um, your test set. You, um, you optimize the model based on that dev set. And once you're really, really confident that you're going, going to um, perform well based on uh, your, your dev set experiments, you then run it on um, the test set. And at that point, it sort of pencils down. Whatever you do on the test set is as good as your model can do, and you end the experiment completely. Enough with that tangent. Let's get back to this Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. Um, we're first going to build the vocabulary from our um, corpus. Um, the vocabulary, again, is just a mapping back and forth between tokens in the sentence and um, the numeric IDs that are actually going to be stored in the tensor we, we train with. Um, so we're setting a max um, vocabulary to 10,000. Um, and we're also setting special tokens for situations where we don't know what the word is, our unknown token, and then padding in case um, sentences aren't quite the right length, we'll add this padding um, to make our, our tensor square as it's passed in to training. Um, but we can then ignore the actual padding um, ID when it, when it comes to training. Um, we're going to create sort of a, a transform to apply our tokenizer on the fly to the text as we pass it through. Um, this is just one way to do it. It is sort of modeled after uh, Torch Text Transforms library. Um, all it's going to do is bind a tokenizer to, again, this um, some object, um, and then apply that to the inputs as it comes through. This may look kind of fancy, if else, whatever. Um, all it's doing is checking to see if you have lists of uh, lists of sentences or if you have just a single sentence coming in. Um, and so it, it's just a nice way of dealing with um, single inputs versus batched inputs. Finally, we're going to just package that um, tokenizer transform we just made um, along with... Um, a vocab transform and all this does is applies um, the vocab mapping to whatever uh, text we give it. Last thing we want to do data wise is to build a data loader for our um, for our sets. Um, Collation here refers to basically packaging um, the different items in a batch together so that they all have the same padded length. So all this is going to do is grab all the, um, the text in an input batch, um, make sure they've been tokenized, turned to token IDs correctly, um, and then padded out to the length of the the largest item in your batch. Our data loader is then going to um, be our way of accessing different batches from our data set. Um, we'll set a batch size, which just says how many examples are in each batch. 
Um, in machine learning, this is a very important number because it sort of says um, how many examples do you want to train with to correspond with one gradient update of your machine learning model. Um, so lots of a very large batch size is go going to correspond potentially to um, seeing many, many um, examples in our training uh, for just a single uh, update to the model. And that may potentially be nice because it could mean you end up um, you end up having very even uh, updates to your your model. You'll be able to average out the gradients of many, many examples um, instead of just having big updates one at a time uh, by seeing examples one by one. Um, we want to shuffle our training set just so that it'll see a different ordering each time it uh, gets trained. And that just ensures that it doesn't see different examples over and over in the same order. Um, and we'll do sort of the same with our um, dev set, except it doesn't really matter whether or not we shuffle for the, the dev set. It'll go through all of the examples in, in our dev data set. Um, and you're not actually updating the gradient with it. so putting shuffle true or false doesn't really um, matter for performance. We'll ultimately just average the performance uh, via accuracy. Um, so um, we can just turn the shuffle to false for the dev set. If we wanted to print out just a single example and see what this looks like for our 64 batch tensor, um, we'll have, or 64 batch, um, training loader, we're going to have um, the first part of it correspond to the labels in our um, set. So these are all our prediction targets. Um, and then you'll have the sentences turned into tokens. Um, in our case, each of the rows is actually going to correspond to a different um, uh, each row corresponds to, say, the first, second, third word in all of the sentences in our batch. Um, so you can think of a single sentence as just being uh, like a vertical column of this data. So in our case, all of these ones are our padding um, and so you'll have shorter sentences that end earlier and then get padded out to the end. Um, and then you'll have some that um, are the full length. So with our data loader set, we can look at our training code and we're gonna just use a simple training loop. Um, we'll keep track of our loss. That's to say how much sort of how far we are averaged from the, um, the ideal um, version of our predictions. Um, and we'll sort of average this over the total number of samples we see. Um, we're going to split our batch into the outputs, that first part that we just talked about, and then the inputs, the, um, the sentences, the that we talked about earlier. Um, in Torch, you can use this two device convention to move a tensor onto a GPU. And that allows you to train much, much faster with it compared to running it on say like CPU. But you need to move all of your things to the same device in order for it to have access and do computation on it. Um, once we've move things around appropriately. We're going to pass this into our model and then create some predictions from it. We'll then use our predictions and then the actual gold targets um, and calculate the loss from that. So our criterion is cross-entropy loss. 
Um, and that just is a way of measuring how far the probability distributions are of our, um, of our model outputs and um, the goal labels are. Um, and once we're done, we do this, this very standard loop at the end, very standard uh, sequence of steps at the end of our um, update. And so what, how this works is we'll zero the gradient buffer um, and then pass, um, we'll, we'll do a back propagation uh, pass through um, and then update the, use the optimizer to update the weights in our model based on uh, the, the back propagation we just did. Um, that's it for our training loop. A similar thing sort of happens with our evaluation loop with the exception that we skip all over that last part. Um, we simply unpack our batch, put it to the device, make predictions, and then uh, use torch max to get the, um, the actual top one prediction for our model. Um, and then we compare the predicted versions versus the, um, the gold labels. Um, and calculate an accuracy from that. For our actual model, we will set it up in a similar way to how we set up the simple dropout model before. We'll create a class um, that inherits from this NN module um, class. Uh, so if you're familiar with programming, we're subclassing um, to create our own version of this PyTorch template class. Um, we'll name it this FFN, um, and then we'll create an initialization function that allows us to set up different attributes of our model that we may want to change. So the things we'll take in as inputs are the um, classification size, so the number of um, classification targets we want to predict on, um, the number of layers we want to generate in our model. And so um, we can use this by basically doing a loop where we generate um, a number of different uh, um, components that can continually get added into our um, into our list of um, components in the model. We'll give it a number of units we want to have. Um, as hidden units in our linear layers. Uh, we need to keep track of the total vocab size in our um, vocabulary because this allows us to create the embedding bag cor correctly so it maps between our actual vocabulary and um, the appropriate number of tensors in the embedding bag. Um, our embedding size just says how large a tensor do we want to represent each individual token in our data set? And finally, the dropout probability, which will apply to each of the layers in our model. So we are going to do like a very simple way to create our model, which is create a module list um, that we're then going to just stuff everything onto. So our module list keeps track of um, all of the items in our model um, and you can append onto it um, to add it to the stack. Um, what's nice about this is that it makes our forward loop very, very simple because our um, the module list is a list <laughs> slayer because the module list is a list um, you can loop through it um, and simply grab each element in the list to use as part of your training. So what this does is basically says, go for each of the items we put on the module list um, and then take that, um, take your input at that point, pass it through that component in the module list, and then um, set your input for the next round to be the output from that layer. So you go through it 
you'll grab um, an element in the module list, pass your current input through it, save it for the next round, and then pass it on and on through all of the, the module list one after another. So it's a very handy way to do it. it makes your forward function very simple um, and is just sort of a nice way to allow you to build um, networks that could have um, lots of different components on them. Um, so back to our network, we're going to have a couple of things that we need in the first layer. So our first thing we want to add onto our module list is an embedding bag. And this will convert all of the token IDs we get from our uh, data loader um, into a single um, compressed um, embedding that represents a summary of the sentence. Um, once we have that, we can pass it to our first linear layer, which is going to uh, which is going to um, go from whatever embedding size we set up for the embedding bag to the size of our internal uh, model, the hidden unit size of the rest of the models. Um, and you can have, you, you need to change the code, but it would certainly be reasonable for different layers to have a different linear unit size, totally reasonable to do. Um, you could just give a, a list if you wanted to format it, um, uh, create it in a way where you're using a list of different values for the different layers uh, to set things up. Uh, in our case, though, it's much easier just to say all of the linear layers have a different number of units, and you just use that units for each of the linear layers in your model. So we're going to do that way just because it's easy. Um, then once Every time we pass through a linear unit, we're going to have it also pass through a nonlinearity. In our case, we're just using ReLU. You could use, uh, you can swap that out for anything. Um, and it might have different properties when it's training. Some might perform better. So after our first sort of set of um, uh, our entry layers, we're going to just loop through the number of layers we've given for our model. Um, and we'll build out for each uh, layer a, a linear unit, a nonlinearity, and then drop out. Um, and we can stack as many of those as we want to create as deep a model as we want. Once we've built out all of our layers, we're going to add a, um, a final layer that is going to project down to that classification size of our task, um, and then send that through softmax just to get the probability distribution. All right, um, with that done, we can now create and train our model. Um, so we'll initialize our model by just feeding in different values to our FFN initialization function. So we're going to create a two-layer um, module um, let's see. So we have output size here. So it's a binary classification task. We'll use three layers in our model. Um, so in total, that'll have five linear blocks. You'll have one at the very start, three for the layers in the center, and then one projection layer at the end. Um, we will use a hidden unit size of 128. Um, we'll just grab the number of items in our vocabulary to set the vocabulary size. Um, we'll actually keep the same uh, size as our hidden layers for our embedding layer. And, and we'll just choose some arbitrary low value for dropout. Once the model is made, we can pass it to our um, our device, so this will be our GPU. Um, and then the last two things before we start training are setting up an optimizer, in which case we'll use stochastic gradient descent, um, and then setting up a criteria, which as I've mentioned earlier, we'll use cross-entropy loss. For our optimizer, 
um, it's important to set a reasonable learning rate. So a learning rate says for each gradient step, how big do you want the gradient step to be? Um, so this is seems like kind of this weird arbitrary value. Um, and as you train uh, different networks, um, you'll get some intuition of like what it might mean. Um, for different optimizers, you might have different conventions for how you set the value for stochastic gradient descent. A value of like 0 0.01 is fairly reasonable. For different amounts of data and different tasks, you'd want to optimize this, uh, this value. And so as with the rest of the model parameters, um, it might not quite be optimized right off the bat for the task you're working with, um, which is why you usually do some experimentation. You use that dev set, you change these different hyperparameters, um, and you eventually optimize it. So it, you find the one that does the best on the dev set um, before you're confident that your model is, is good to go. The last thing to mention about SGD is it uses um, some sort of something called momentum. And it just says, um, after each gradient update, how much do you sort of want to remember the last update you made and go sort of in that same direction? So it's helpful because it acts, it allows you to sort of like um, more easily get over hills that you might encounter in the gradient landscape um, and allows you to avoid getting trapped in uh, either a bad initialization or sort of like a, a, a hole in your, um, in your optimization landscape where it might be a local minimum, but it might be actually very far from the best you could do in the problem. So you could easily get your, um, your model get trapped in some sort of bad state um, and things like momentum allow you to get around it. Different optimizers have, have different tools to get around it as well. The last thing is setting a number of epics to go through. So an epic is a number of times for which you will see the entirety of the data set in training. Um, there's two sort of um, time parameters you could think of in uh, neural net training. One is epics, so count the number of times you see the full data step. And then the other approach is something called steps. And steps indicate a number of times when you've made a gradient update. Um, because the two are both sort of useful properties to think about, um, Epic says like how many times you've seen the full data set. Um, that's useful because if you know that the number of epics is really high, it keeps seeing it over and over and over again. Um, at some point, you'd expect it to not really gain that much from further training. Conversely, steps is also really useful because it says how many updates you've made to the model. Um, and for very fancy newer model configurations, that's sort of the preferred way to um, talk about the training process is you say um, you train for X number of steps um, and then you don't really have to worry about um, the total training size that you're looking at. Um, but rather just think of how how much you've changed the, um, the model in this training process. For our training loop, we are just going to first calculate, um, we're gonna apply uh, a, the training function that we went over before. Um, we'll evaluate for that epic on the train data, and then we'll do the same thing with the development data. Uh, so this allows us to say how well we're training on the train set, and then how well we're training on some unseen development set, or, or rather this like um, not directly trained on uh, set. Some important things to report back are which epic we're on, how much loss 
um, were we've sort of uh, generated. Um, and again, this is the per item loss that we're calculating. Um, and then the accuracies on our train set and our validation set. So I've just done a, a simple train set here up to 30 epics um, with example outputs given. Your results may vary um, if you train it yourself. Um, it took maybe like 15 minutes on a, on a smaller laptop GPU when I trained it. Um, and we ended up getting about 65% uh, accuracy on the development set at about Epic 12. Um, so any further training, uh, actually it did get up a little bit later on, um, but it seems to have plateaued between 64 and 65 or 67, um, somewhere in there uh, after a while. So you would train it, um, and um, there is this idea of a model uh, converging after some point. And the, the idea is once a model is converged, your validation accuracy isn't going to change too much, and um, it'll look like a plateau. So if we were to sort of plot these results out, we can look at our loss, which will drop um, as you continue training because it's um, it's getting closer and closer to the optimal version of the model. Our training accuracy is going to go up. So it gets to around 90% here. Um, and then oftentimes what you see is your validation accuracy improves, but then plateaus at some point. So um, in this configuration, we couldn't really get it more than about 65, 67%. Um, this is super unoptimized. I simply grabbed a bunch of numbers to set up this model. Um, and a better process would be to um, do some hyperparameter search on the, the model configuration. Um, train it under, under different hyperparameters and then eventually evaluate and see which one has the best um, development set accuracy. That's it for our most simple feed forward network. Um, I hope to see you and join me for the next tutorial, which will be on convolution neural networks. Thank you.